I want to present, um, I want to present uh, how raw logic uses the RISC-V to um, optimize FPGAs and um, implement ASICs for, uh, for um, technology optimization. A little bit about raw logic. It's a very small consultancy firm. Uh, we specialize in custom IP and um, FPGA migrations. Uh, it's, a, it's a new firm. We just uh, got really uh, incorporated last year um, with a strong uh, academic background. So the, most of the uh, employees or the contractors are all PhDs and masters. Reason uh, why, we, um, why we're working on, on uh, IP and the RISC-V is for uh, freedom, what we call freedom of design. In the um, ASIC industry, uh, there's, or in the ASIC landscape, there's currently three technologies that are predominant. One is the FPGAs, which are really cool for prototyping and low volume. Um, there's no NRE involved, and in, in you pretty much get the tools for free. You can run on your uh, home PC, and um, if you've got a product, you can bring out the product very quickly. And then there's on the other extreme, there are the standard cell ASICs, which are fully customized, um, uh, large uh, time to market, high NRE uh, for the mask and for the tools, but they give you the highest performance, the lowest uh, power, and the lowest unit price. And then in the middle, uh, uh, middle field is uh, what's called platform ASICs. And these are um, what, what used to be defined as structured ASICs. So they're like a, a predefined structure that you can customize with either metal or, um, or via layers. And then depending on the market conditions, you want to migrate between all these technologies. You might want to start your design in an FPGA, go to market, test the market. And then as your uh, volume increases or you get on the price pressure, you might quickly want to migrate to, uh, to a different platform, different technology. Now, what we noticed while uh, assisting customers in doing this is that they get themselves locked into a particular technology. If they choose um, uh, uh, PCI Express from, that's available in the FPGAs, then we have to replace that with, uh, with an off-the-shelf IP. So that has to be replaced. That can be done. What is much more difficult is to replace the FPGA CPUs. So if, they, if the customer uses a NEOS or a Microblaze CPU, then they're pretty much stuck to that FPGA. What, we, uh, what we're working on is a way to make this easier. Why would anybody want to migrate to, uh, to an ASIC? Well, it's for four reasons, which we define as the four Ps, and I highlighted them before. One is price. FPGAs are expensive, so you might want to migrate to a new technology for cost reductions. Um, second one is performance. Um, FPGAs have a performance limit, uh, and if you need more than a couple of hundred megahertz, then this can't be done with FPGA. so you need to go to a, a different uh, technology. Power reduction, go, moving to a, a platform, a standard ASIC will definitely reduce the power of, uh, of your device. Um, very important if it's in a closed box or up in a, in a tower where every, uh, every watt counts. And the last one is, is protection. Uh, protection against um, IP theft, security breach, um, event upsets. We've got customers in the avionics industry which are very concerned about the single event and multiple bit event upsets in the FPGAs. And then lastly, platform availability. Um, there's a large hookup in the, uh, in the FPGA landscape now, and we do see customers that are worried about, uh, about the outcome of all the, uh, um, of all the acquisitions. Um, there's customers that have existing ASICs that go obsolete, and we assist those in, in the migration as well. Um, we've done a couple of, uh, a small study, and to look at what CPUs are available already that can be used to retarget the FPGA uh, CPUs. Um, number of closed ones, so proprietary CPUs, the number of uh, open uh, uh, source CPUs. And we came to the conclusion that all of these have their limitations. Um, they have the good things, but also they have major limitations. Most importantly, the, the, um, the high NREs, so the high upfront cost, is a, uh, is a showstopper for our customers, especially compared to the, uh, to the free NEOs and microbase CPUs they get from the FPGA vendors. Technology applicability or availability. Some of these um, cores are simply either targeted at an ASIC or an FPGA, and you can't easily migrate between them. Um, definitely the, the uh, level uh, or the, the age of the instruction set is showing in, uh, in a number of these, especially if you look at the Sparks, for example. And then, uh, especially for the open source CPUs, 
uh, customers are very worried about potential legal issues. Um, they still have a worry uh, of, uh, that open source means someone can come in and demand them to open up all their source or uh, they're scared simply to engage with something that is out there that is not proprietary. So what we need for, uh, for this optimization is um, a CPU that's royalty free, that can be migrated between all the technologies, is equally well suited for implementations in FPGA and in, uh, and in ASIC technology. It has to be small, um, flexible instruction sets and feature sets such the, that we can tune the, um, the performance and the features of the CPU to the customer's requirements. And then it has to have um, a non-specific bus. So the bus interface needs to be open for, uh, for any implementation. If we were replacing a uh, CPU with an AHB interface, our CPU has to have an AHB interface. It's a, if it's an Avalon, it has to have an Avalon interface. And we came to the conclusion that the RISC V um, allowed, uh, allowed us to do all of this. So what we did is we came up with, or we implemented uh, the, uh, the RISC V uh, integer set um, as a base and uh, what we call an RV11, which is an in-order, single-issue, single-thread uh, uh, CPU. Um, it's fully parameterized, so uh, most of the extensions have been implemented, and it can be enabled or disabled. It's got a, uh, full parameters for caches, instruction cache, data cache, uh, branch prediction. The, uh, it comes with a number of bus interfaces, and um, it's really intended to be a drop-in replacement for the, F, uh, the FPGA CPU. Now the implementation itself is what we call a folded optimizing five-stage pipeline. It's not really like a classic five-stage, and I've got a, a slide later on that shows a bit more how, what this looks like. Um, some of the classic uh, risk stages have been folded together in, uh, in, a, in the same stage, and um, optimizing here it's, uh, means that it's capable of absorbing stalls in the pipeline. So, um, as an example, it can detect if there's a dependency on memory accesses between the memory instruction and the next instruction, and then it will actually swap the next and the upcoming instruction, the two, the two of them, if there's no dependency. And this allows us to absorb uh, a number of stalls in the pipeline. And most importantly, the, the CPU is, is designed um, for FPGA to ASIC migration. So it performs well in, the, in an FPGA, 100 to 200 megahertz, but it's really intended to be implemented in an ASIC then. Um, small block diagram of, the, uh, of our core um, the classic uh, pipeline with the fetch, pre-decode, decode, execute, and write back. A um, couple of neat things, so the, the, the fetch and the pre-decode uh, jumps and branches are all handled in the fetch together with the brand, uh, branch predictor. The pre-decode handles the um, uh, compressed instructions, so this is where the RVC is expanded into traditional 32-bit um, uh, uh, RISC-V instructions. And then the decode and optimizes, the, uh, it prepares the, the, the values for the, uh, for the execution units, and it's the uh, portion that actually swaps uh, instructions in order to, uh, to hide uh, pipeline stalls. And then execute and write back is the traditional execute write back. And the memory access is actually parallel to this, such that we save a cycle in the entire pipeline. Um, in, uh, caches and branch prediction is fully optional. We uh, implemented a debug unit that is based on the advanced debug system found in open course. We ported that to, uh, to the RISC-V, and that seems to be working. And then we've got this flexible instruction and data interface where we can select which bus we want to uh, connect to. So as an example, um, there's a customer case study where we had to replace a Neos 2 32-bit control plane CPU. Customer requirements were uh, a ho over 100 uh, uh, dry stone MIPS. As I said, it's a control plane CPU, and typically there's not a very high performance requirements uh, in this area, but resource requirement is, uh, is uh, very important. They didn't need an MNU, no caches, and they had to have an HB3 interface. And what's missing here, they, they wanted JTAG debug and JTAG serial port. So that's what we implemented in the, um, in the debug unit. Now what we did is we replaced the NEOS in the FPGA, and that's being tested and debugged uh, at the moment. So the customer design uh, took out the NEOS CPU and replaced it with the RISC-V, did a software recompile, 
and then we are testing and debugging this at the moment. And then once this is complete, it will be migrated into a platform ASIC. The, our company has a, a very strong tie with a, a platform ASIC company here in the, uh, in the in Silicon Valley. So with, uh, we target most of our designs to eASIC, the platform ASIC. And this will be targeted at a 28 nanometer structural ASIC from, uh, from eASIC. Um, the replacement flow that we take, um, we always start with the existing FPGA or ASIC design. We work from the RTL. And then we replace the CPU and implement this in the FPGA and then have the customer test and verify the system with the new CPU. And then at the same time, uh, we replace additional technology-specific blocks, think uh, um, pads, PLLs. They have to be replaced to the target uh, technology. And then we go into the uh, platform ASIC synthesis, which very much looks like the traditional FPGA flow. So we use uh, synthesis with a design compiler, and then we go into dedicated uh, place and route tools, um, and then uh, physical verification with uh, uh, synopsis tools again, and we tape out. The typical uh, timeline for this entire flow from the time we engage until we ship silicon, so uh, ASICs to the customers is about six months, which is really fast, uh, fast turnaround for, uh, for ASICs. Some of the implementation results, um, we're still working on the CPU, but some of the uh, uh, results we have so far, the customer's FPGA was a Cyclone 5. Um, the core we implemented was uh, with, with a number of options. So it's got a branch predictor, it's got a performance option, which means it's, it's, um, it's not the smallest version that we have, but it's about uh, 2,000 logic cells in the Cyclone 5 with about 15 on the flip-flops. And we achieve 114 megahertz, so more than the 100 megahertz the customer wanted. Power for the core is about 500 milliwatt. This is, um, f uh, th these are the results from the Altera tool. And then we implemented this in the EASIC Nexium 3 technology. Um, and we get 650 megahertz in that technology and uh, 170 milliwatt uh, uh, power at 650 megahertz. What we've shown here uh, with this approach is that we have a viable solution for migrating customer designs with a uh, dedicated target CPU uh, using the RISC-V to a general purpose CPU and then implement this um, in an ASIC technology. Um, it also uh, has proven that we can achieve the four Ps that we uh, mentioned before. We have a, a price reduction for the customer by going to the, uh, to the ASIC. Um, performance increase, as you can see, we went from 100 megahertz to a 650 megahertz. And uh, we can save uh, power on the implementation by about 70%. Now, there's still more work to do. Um, uh, we need to optimize the register files. We need to get the, the design smaller, but that's all, in, that's all in the pipe. And again, a summary, which I pretty much just did. So uh, we did imp uh, already implement the RISC-V in a technology-independent manner. Uh, RV11 is our first implementation. We've got a number of others on the drawing board or already working on it. Um, there's a two-issue uh, dual-thread uh, CPU that we're working on. And if required, we might even implement an out-of-order one. Uh, although at, for um, our market that we operate in, we don't see a real need for that. Um, we successfully replaced uh, uh, the, CPU, uh, the FPGA CPU using RISC V. It's working. Customers happy with that one. Um, and we were able to, uh, to reduce their power and price uh, on the current implementation. And I think that's it. Any questions? Joel Sandgate, Microvision. On the hot topic of the debug core that you interface or implemented, how did you have to modify the RISC-V core itself? Did you implement a halt or hook into it in any way? Yeah, so um, what we implemented so far is, um, are the basic instructions. Uh, the debug unit issues a halt to the CPU, which simply stalls the entire pipeline. And then uh, when the CPU is halted, it opens up the entire CSRs and the register files for examination. Um, you can reset the CPU uh, and you can single step. That's pretty much all the functionality that's there. No breakpoints. Um, hardware breakpoints is, um, is, are available, they're just not functioning at the moment.
Hi, Rishi Runikil from BlueSpec. Uh, is this uh, just the user level instruction set or system instruction um, set as well? No, it's, uh, what we implemented is the complete supervisor uh, spec, the 1.9. So it's got the uh, machine mode, supervisor mode, whatever is available in hypervisor mode, and machine mode. That is all implemented. Um, uh, uh, so the, super, the supervisor, the user, and the compressed uh, instruction set that's implemented and that's available. Uh, the results shown are for that, uh, for that implementation. Oh, thanks. Uh, Dave Patterson from Berkeley. As, as outsiders, were, did you have difficulties uh, with the documentation or knowing what to build or verification or things like that? Um, uh, for verification, we used the, um, the test suite that's available from, from Berkeley. So we uh, recreated our own regression uh, test based on those. Um, it's a make file. You can specify what options, uh, what parameters uh, should be uh, pushed into the, into the CPU, and then it loads the specific tests for that, uh, for that implementation, and then it checks the results. So that's what we did for, um, for the implementation. Documentation is, I would say, it's pretty, it's okay. There's still a few ambiguities, and we actually had to use the, the tests to figure out on how some of the instructions were supposed to work. Um, but it, it, was, it was okay, it was clear. Are, are there things you wish uh, that should be there that aren't, that would help other people do what you did? <laughs> Um, there's a lot missing um, since, since you're asking. What, I'm, what we're definitely missing is uh, the platform specification. Where's, where's the uh, program, uh, the, the interrupt controller? How is that supposed to work? How do you hook it up? Um, uh, uh, cacheable, non cacheable regions, how do you specify this? The debug interface is not specified. So that's currently our implementation and our guess on, on how, it, how it works, but it should really be standardized. I had a quick question, Krista from Berkeley. Um, how did the customer find the ISA compared against the NEOS? Um, the customer was open to recompile the software, so that's always, uh, um, that might be an issue. Some customers simply don't want or can't touch the software because then, then multiple teams get involved. If we're in, uh, in a migration from an FPGA to an ASIC, then we're talking to the hardware team. Once you need to start touching the software, suddenly the software team and the verification team get involved and the effort gets much bigger. And um, it just might not be worthwhile the, the, for the customer. And this particular customer had no uh, problem recompiling the software. And the entire design was written in C. So they just need uh, a bare metal boot up to go into main. And then uh, um, from there, um, basic tests we did were just simulation and RTL and then emulation on the FPGA. So things like code size? Um, it's really tiny. It's, it's, a, it's a controlled plane CPU. So it fits in, in a block RAM. Okay. Question here. Do you support clock gating or power gating? Okay. Um, no. Uh, should be, but no, not, not yet. Are there plans to migrate the design to standard cell? ASIC? Any plans to migrate to Stanza? Um, the, the design is it's, uh, intended to be migratable, so uh, uh, we offer a two-step approach. Start with the FPGA, and then as volumes increase, uh, migrate to the platform ASIC, which gets you into the market with an ASIC and an optimized, um, optimized implementation pretty quick in a matter of six months to nine months. And then as, um, as the volume increases, or if you, if you see need, then we can quickly migrate that platform ASIC into a standard cell ASIC. We have already done the synthesis, we have the database, so from there on it's very quick to do, uh, to do this additional path. So um, the path is definitely there, we just have not done this one. 